Hey everyone, Justin here once again, bringing you the third video in a short series on how to play bolt action. Uh, if you haven't seen the first two, go back and check them out. One just kind of covers the basis of the game, the second video is on moving. This is the meat and potatoes, this is shooting. Um, I preface every video as I'm going to preface this one. This is not an all-inclusive how-to everything with all the special little rules. This is just give you a basis on how to play. Now we will cover infantry, uh, big guns like artillery and all that, and then uh, vehicles um, as I have in the other videos. Um, but again, I'm not going to go into every little detail on all the special rules. I'm just going to give you a real quick brief overview on how to play different scenarios um, using cover moving and shooting things of that nature um, so again I'll try to cover as much as possible of the important stuff to give you a good idea but not every little bit so uh, what I'm gonna do is I got the table set up I'll give you a brief overview of what the table looks like um, how we personally play certain type of terrain just like in any game system it's always good before you start putting models down to talk about the terrain on a table and how it's going to be played um, as far as dense terrain and movable um, that kind of stuff, how you actually going to play because that will play an effect with uh, cover, um, hard cover, soft cover, things of that nature when, once you get shooting and it's best to have that all determined before you actually start putting models down on the table to ease on the arguments a little bit. Um, so we'll give you a quick overview of the table here and then um, we'll get into showing some um, scenarios on how you do shooting in bolt action. All right, guys, so for this demonstration, I just have a little quick 4x4 set up, um, kind of the outskirts of a village with a little farm area um, leading into what would be the, the village to the left here. Um, we personally like to play with a lot of terrain in this game. I do recommend it. Um, so you see a couple different things here. Uh, we obviously have buildings. We always play the whole buildings as an actual building. Um, including this one here because you can still enter it. The destroyed buildings here you can play as difficult terrain. Again it's kind of up to you and your opponent how you want to play. Um, that is woods back there. I was just too lazy to dig out my trees because I have no clue what happens to them. Um, and again however you want to play it. If you want to play block complete line of sight because they're dense. If you just want to play it as shrubbery and gives you soft cover, hard cover, whatever it may be based on a scenario. Um, we have hedgerows set up. I always play, or we always play these hedgerows as hardcover. They are smaller hedgerows. When a guy's standing behind it, you'll see that they can still kind of see over it. So we just play as hardcover. Um, we got some buddies that have much larger ones that they actually play um, as blocks line of sight. Um, as they play them as bocage type of deal. Um, again, as long as you determine beforehand. We play, we have two areas of farmland set up over here. Two little fields area. Um, we usually play for shooting through the fences. It gives you soft cover um, just because of the chance to ricochet or slowing down the bullet, whatever you want to play it as or call it as, um, but that's soft cover. So that's going to be the table. We're going to run some different demonstrations on here. I will get a whole bunch of troops set up on a table and we will go over a few different scenarios and talk about shooting in depth here in a moment. All right, guys, so we got the table set up with some troops all around. Um, we're getting shooting. First, let's talk about the procedures in the shooting phase. Um, we're on page 49 in the rule book for those that are following along. Uh, but let's let's talk, before we even get into that, let's talk about some, some standards, of course, with the shooting phase. Um, as with anything else, you cannot pre-measure. So all weapons have a range. Um, you just have to guess that you're in that range. You cannot pre-measure. Um, also, obviously, when we're in a shooting phase, so any units that are given a fire or an advance can shoot. Uh, whether you pull an, an action dice right away and they're not going to move, they're going to stay stationary and fire, you flip the fire, you shoot. If they've advanced, not run, but advanced, they can then go to a fire at a penalty, which we'll get into. Um, obviously, if they are in a, uh, if they have an activation dice near them for ambush, you can trigger that ambush any time, and that's an out-of-turn shooting sequence when your opponent is moving. Um, and we'll show you a scenario of that in a second. So, the procedures of shooting. There's actually seven steps in the shooting. I'll run them down them real quick here, and then we'll actually go in detail through them with a demonstration. So, uh, first you're going to declare your target. Then the target will react. If the target chooses to go down, that's when they would do it at that time before any dice are rolled. As soon as you declare them a target, they would have to declare them. Uh, that they're going down. 
you would then measure range and open fire. Uh, to do that, step four is you're going to roll to hit. Um, for every shot fired, you roll 1d6 and you roll to hit. Once you see how many hits you have, step five is you're going to roll to damage. Step six is then you'll take those casualties off the board. And step seven is your opponent will then roll morale. So let's get into actually showing you how that works in the mechanics of the game. Okay, so procedure one, step one in shooting is to declare a target. Seems easy enough. We have a group of Finnish infantry right here. They're going to fire on some Brits here behind this uh, fence, which will give them soft cover, but we'll get into that. Um, so straightforward, going to open fire. So declare a target. You pick a uh, target, then declare you're going to shoot at them. The unit must be a viable target. What that means is they have to be visible. There cannot be any intervening friendlies. If you have a friendly unit in front of them, you cannot shoot at them. You cannot shoot at any unit that brings a shot within one inch of a friendly. So if we have a unit here, you would measure on either side of it. And if it's within one inch of that, you would not be able to fire. You can, however, shoot if we had, say, a tank set up in the center here because small arms fire cannot harm that tank. So you'd still be able to shoot at because there's no risk of actually harming any friendlies. Um, so there is that. Uh, it works the same exact for indirect fire. Uh, when you're firing, it can't be, uh, has to be a visible target, can't be inter intervening, anything like that. Um, you can fire through enemy units. So say if there was a unit sitting back here of bricks that I would choose to fire at them because for some reason I deem them more of a threat, you could, but they would get a cover for shooting through intervening enemy units. So simple as that. You declare your target, you make sure it's within those parameters to be able to be shot at. The target reacts. Uh, if they have not taken an action, there's no action die near in this turn, they can then choose to go down, again, before any dice are rolled. They have to, they have to be quick, they have to declare, give your opponent time to decide if they're going to do that. <coughs> it always helps, I remind them, hey, I'm shooting at these guys, do they, want, do they want to go down? Remind them of that, so as soon as you start rolling dice, they can't go, oh wait, I want them to go down, because once the dice is rolled, it's too late. Uh, then at that time, you would take a die out of the bag, you would place it near them in a down position, um, which will then will give them a down cover bonus, which we will get into when we actually get into shooting here in a second. Okay, now that we know we have viable targets, we're going to measure range and open fire. So the way to do that is determine the maximum range, check the max range for each weapon you have. So I have an SMG, uh, two of them actually in a squad, an SMG there and an SMG here. I also have an LMG, and then the rest are rifles. SMGs have a max range of 12 inches, an LMG is 36 inch, standard rifle is 12 inch. So you measure from each model to the closest visible enemy. So obviously, and, and again, as you get going with the game, you can quick do go, well, the minimum range of everything is 12 inches, so everything's within 12. The only thing that plays a role is when we get into modifiers and shooting, if you're within half the distance of a max range, then you get a plus one to your bonus on shooting. So first we measure, we say, yep, <clears throat> everything is in, so we know we're good there. Uh, at that time, you would begin to determine who can fire. Any, uh, any model that can fire must fire. You cannot hold fire. I can't say, oh, these guys aren't going to shoot, and I'm going to put them in ambush or whatever. No. Every model that can, must. Um, you cannot split the fire. So everything in here, if you declare them the target, everything has to fire at them. There is an exception of one-shot weapons. Um, I do have two Panzerfausts in here. Uh, the guys throwing the Molotovs are actually Panzerfausts. I don't have those modeled uh, that way because when you get into metal troops, it's kind of hard to find the right models. Um, but they are a one-shot weapon. If there was an armor... Uh, ve or armored vehicles somewhere that I'd be able to shoot at them, I could then choose to shoot them at that. That is the only time you can split fire is with one-shot weapons. Other than that, I can't put half here, and then we have some in the building here. I can't put half on that building. All targets or all shots have to go on that target. Uh, if the model can't see or is out of range for whatever reason, if I had a guy way back here out of range, he would not be able to shoot. And then at that point, you're going to roll, roll a d6 for each shot the weapons have. So, you would look at the book to figure out the, the number of shots each one has. <clears throat> SMGs I know have two shots, LMGs have four, rifles each have uh, one. 
So once we know how many they have, you're going to roll the hit, which we're in step four now. This you would do by rolling all these six together. Now what I do is I split it a little bit because uh, it's going to change based off the modifiers, which we will get into here in a second. Okay, now that we know we have viable targets and they are within range, we are now going to actually roll to hit. Before we actually start rolling dice, uh, let's start with the basics on that. Uh, to actually score a hit, it's a base three. So you need a three up on your dice. Now, there is a modifier chart on page 54 if you have the rule book and you're following along. I'll briefly touch base on all of these here. Uh, so we have shooting at point blank range. If you're within six inches, it's point blank range. It actually gives you a plus one modifier. So that three would become a two. Uh, if these guys have a pin on them, it's negative one per pin. So obviously that's what we talked about earlier about putting pins on. It's, it helps to stack up a unit with pins because the more pins they have, the harder it is for them to be able to shoot. If you're firing at long range, long range is considered anything over half the distance. So uh, whatever your max distance is, half of that is considered short range, anything above that's long range. So for rifles are 24 inches, it's a 12. SMGs are 12, anything over six inches. LMG, uh, 36 inches, anything over 18 is considered long range, so on and so forth. Look at your weapon stats to see exactly what they can shoot. If these guys would be inexperienced, it is another negative one. If you have advanced them, flip the die to fire, and they're going to shoot now, it's a negative one because they're firing on the move. Uh, if the target had gone down, if the, when you gave them that opportunity, if they chose, you know what, these guys are going down, pulling an action die out, putting them down, it's actually negative two. They're hugging the earth, they're harder to hit. Uh, if the target is a small unit, a small unit is considered two or less. So sniper teams, uh, your mortars, like your small mortars or your two-man team, things of that nature, they're considered a small unit. If the target is in soft cover, it's a negative one. If it's hard cover, it's a negative two. There's some special modifiers for buildings too, but that's later on in the wound roll, and we'll get into that. Um, and again, so this is important when you're playing cover with, with your opponents to determine how you're going to play. We play that as long as you're right up against the barrier, this you're not shooting through this because you're actually shooting over it, so this wouldn't be a negative modifier. If you got guys in the back row shooting, then yes, you're shooting through this because you're not up against it. Uh, but in a case like this, modifiers on cover don't stack. You take the worst it is. So since you're shooting through soft cover here anyway, it doesn't matter if you got them back because it's only going to be a negative one because you're shooting through the cover. So once you figure out and determine all of those modifiers, um, then you're going to start rolling dice. Before you start rolling dice, uh, there's a thing in this game system called nigh impossible shots. If after you add all those modifiers, you need higher than a six, uh, which does happen quite often, you can still make the shot. Uh, what you would do is you would roll a dice. If you roll and get a six, you roll a second time for that die. If you get an additional six, it counts as a hit. So you need double sixes, one after another, to make that nigh impossible shot. But it does happen, it is worth rolling it. Um, as I always joke, you know, you don't go home winning any medals by going home with ammo. So if, if you can make a shot on a visible target, take the shot, you never know, you can get those hits. Um, so that is kind of important. Um, again, talking about cover, there is a cover chart on page 57. I'm not going to go into detail. I've kind of laid out what we have here. Um, to figure that all out. So, we're going to start rolling the hit. Again, I roll, uh, you're supposed to roll all of your dice together. So figure out how many shots you have, roll them all together. But when you have separate weapon systems, it is important to roll them differently because your distance will matter um, when it comes into all of that. So I always roll my LMG separate, my two SMGs I'll roll together, and all my rifle I'll roll as one. So we'll start off with the LMG. So you measure from that LMG to the closest enemy. We're in eight inches, which is under half. So I need threes to start. I'm shooting into soft cover, which would be, <coughs> excuse me, which would be fours needed. Um, I'm under half range, so I don't have to worry about long range. I'm not quite within six inches, so I'm not gonna get that. So basically I need fours on these. So we roll and I get three hits with my LMG. I'm going to have my two SMGs fire. SMGs are considered assault twos, so you'll get two shots. They have a 12 inch max range. Um, now I am over six, so I am going to get that long range modifier. So threes become fours because of soft cover. 
become fives because of that long range. And uh, yeah, the fins are motivated there. So it's gonna put another three on them. Now, at this time then, I count how many rifles I have. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. And I do have six here, but it's important to note when you have an LMG, one guy must become the loader. So um, again, I don't have a model that way, but I always designate the guy carrying a rifle a certain way as a loader. So he can't fire because it's too busy helping the LMG. So again, I'll be one, two, three, four, five rifles. Now we're going to fire. And again, we would measure out. They're all under 12. None of them are within six. So threes become four because of soft cover. Two, four, five. And as you can see, you end up needing the same number or the same the same number on the D6 to hit, but it's always good to, again to roll them separately. So because these will actually need fours. So again, the fins are super motivated. So, now that we know how many hits we actually have, now we're gonna roll to see what actually wounded. Okay, so we have all of our hit dice, which was pretty impressive. We only had a couple that missed during all that shooting. Uh, now we're going to roll to see how many actually damaged. The damage value chart is on page 56 of the rule book. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but it's important to know that uh, there's different different dice that you have to roll or different different values that you have to roll depending on the troop level. So if these guys would be inexperienced, you would need a three to wound them. You need a regular, then you need a four. Veteran, need a five. All soft skin vehicles. So if a vehicle is considered soft skin, like uh, some of the transport trucks or even some of the uh, like unarmored scout recon vehicles um, are considered uh, soft skin, you need a sixes. Anything above that, armored cars, uh, tanks, all of those things, they actually have a higher damage value, so you need a 7 or higher depending on them. Now that will play a role into when you get into heavier weapons that have a penetration value. All small arms fire, you're not hitting anything above soft skin. So um, it's important to note that. So these guys are British commandos, so they are pretty high speed, so they're veterans, so I would need 5s. Obviously the level of training that they get would determine how quick once the rounds start firing that they'd be able to react, get down, find cover, as the case may be. So you would then roll all of the dice hit um, in the last roll, and we're going to roll them, and we need fives to actually cause damage. So we roll them, we take out anything that is not a five. So it ends up only being a three. Three actual damage. <clears throat> At that point, the tar we're in stage six, or, or step six, the target then would take their casualties. For every hit that was caused, they would lose one model. Uh, the owning player chooses the model, so the guy who's playing the Brits would actually choose what models happen. Now, this is important to note because I actually got one. A six is, an, is considered an exceptional damage. When a six is rolled for damage, before any modifiers, um, which would count as buildings or whatever the case may be, um, again, we're not gonna cover that right now, but anytime a six is, is um, rolled, you roll a die again. You roll the dice again. <laughs> Beautiful, exactly how I wanted to play out. Another six was rolled. So what that means is that is now exceptional damage. That means the shooter, the fins, would then get to pick the models. So that means you could take specific models out. So with these two fives, obviously the British player is just going to remove two regular infantry. You don't want to take out an LMG. You don't want to take out your, your NCO um, because you want the higher rate of fire. You want that NCO bonus. But because I rolled a six and then rolled a consecutive six, it is now my choice to remove. So I can then pick the NCO. I can then pick the LMG. Obviously, they haven't fired yet. I don't want four shots with that LMG coming on me. I can remove the LMG. When you do that, their loader then just becomes a uh, rifleman like normal. Um, but, boom, I have taken out the LMG. I've gotten to choose. Now, if I roll the six the first time and I reroll and I rolled a two, it just counts as a regular wound, then they would get to remove that casualty. So exceptional damage plays a big role when shooting because you can then pick what you want to take out of that squad, which obviously will affect how they operate for the rest of that turn. Okay, so the final step is now that we've removed the casualties, uh, you would actually then test for morale. Before we do that, uh, stepping back to section four, step four with actually rolling to hit, 
before anyone hollers. They did take a, a hit, um, so they are going to get a pin. Now remember with pinning, it's every time a unit places a hit. So although I did a whole lot of hits there, it was only one unit firing. Now if I had a second unit firing, it would then place another pin on them. But right now it's just the one pin. So step seven is dealing with taking a morale test. If a unit would have lost over half or half or over greater than its models in one shooting phase, it would then have to take a morale test. A morale test is exactly the same as an order test plus all the same modifiers. So if you remember, that would be 2d6. For a veteran, the morale is 10. I, uh, a regular is a 9 and an experience is an 8. So they would have 2d6. They would have a 10 minus the pin, so they would need a 9. And if I can keep it on the table, so they rolled a 4. So they would be good. If a unit would have failed the morale test, they have taken enough casualties to scare them off that they break and they would run from the board. So you would remove the entire unit from the board. Um, now remember, if they have not had a order dice placed by them or taken an action yet, you would then remove a action die from the bag immediately. Um, so you don't get to keep that extra dice in there to, to use to hopefully get an extra turn with some guys um, or to help your odds of pulling one of yours. The dice gets removed immediately. If it's already on the table, just remove it and go from there. So they would pass their pin down. They only took three casualties. They're British commandos. They can they can shrug that off and keep fighting. So that would be it. That is a basic round of shooting uh, with a few modifiers that we've gone into. Um, but that's how it worked. We'll go through a few more examples of some different scenarios. Then we'll get at, into actually artillery firing and then get into vehicle firing. Okay, so before we get talking about artillery and vehicles and get into some other scenarios, I want to talk briefly about ambush. Um, as we said, this is usually an out-of-turn shooting phase. So say if I had this finished unit here placed on ambush, and this unit pulled an activation dice and was going to choose to move. Uh, we had some sneaky Kokoroputo uh, finish come along here on the flank that are about to come around them. Say if they want to get out of dodge here a little bit, and they're going to move back so they're not getting flanked and they can deal with that. So they're going to take a movement phase. Now, um, obviously, as we discussed, you can't run over obstacles, but they would be moving their six inches. So they could get relatively defended behind this building here. Problem is these guys are on ambush. They're going to take that risk. So if they would begin to move at any time between point A and point B of them moving back, this unit could then spring their own ambush out of turn. So say we want to catch them as they're moving a flea up over the fence and come through behind this building, we can catch them in an opening pretty much right here where you can see I can hit, all these guys can hit as these guys would start to run across this opening, this little alley here. At that point, you could then declare that you were hitting them right then and there as they're clearing through and it basically puts all of them can fire at somebody out of cover. So you say at this point, you say, hey, while you're doing that movement, I'm going to point this ambush and we turn this to a fire. And then, then you would just do your shooting phase, those seven steps, just as normal during this phase. So you would do whatever shooting happened. You would remove whatever casualties that happened. At that point, these guys would then be able to finish their movements with whatever guys happen to survive that ambush and get them back to wherever it is. That's pretty much how the rules read. Again, we play it as if, say, if you got these guys here and you're measuring, you say, all right, I'm gonna, I can be able to put them up to here. You can then either keep those guys here, declare the shooting as it would there, or move them to their full distance and then figure out the shooting. That helps basically that you don't move them halfway, for, figure out or forget how far you've already moved them and then have to move them the additional three inches, four inches, whatever's left of the movement phase. You can just declare it that, hey, I'm shooting at a winter crossing right here. Move them, then do the shooting, keep them here, do the shooting, moving. Um, it doesn't honestly matter that much. Um, I have yet to ever play in a tournament where I could see them going one way or another with it. But again, that's how I take the rules itself. So again, an ambush is basically a fiery order taken out of turn during somebody else's movement. And that becomes very useful because, again, then you can direct where in that that order, that movement range, you want to hit them where they're going to be the most vulnerable. So it does play a role. It is very useful. 
Um, you know, because again, they could have shot at him here, but what you know, I, now I can get him in the movement where uh, it's negative one. I only need straight threes really to hit them right there. So sometimes it's better to put a unit in ambush than to see how that plays out. Um, one thing we will talk more about ambush here is say if it is the end of the turn and these guys were placed in the ambush but did not get anybody to fire at. Um, no no target presented themselves. Or these guys were already here when they were put in ambush and instead of going into ambush, they decided to say, or these guys went in ambush and instead of these guys running over, what you're hoping on, they decided they were just gonna shoot over here at these guys and stay there. At the end of the turn, anybody that is still in ambush, you can attempt to put them onto a fire. You would roll a d6, a 4 up, that unit then can fire. On a 3 or lower, it's missed its opportunity and can't shoot. So even putting a unit in ambush, there's still a chance you can shoot at the end of the turn, but you're taking a 50% chance of actually being able to get that shooting off. So I think that pretty much covers a quick overview of ambush and how that works. Um, again, with the out-of-turn shooting phase, we'll go into showing you some other examples of infantry firing um, and some different scenarios, and then we'll get into some of the other stuff. Okay, next scenario we're going to talk about here a little bit is shooting at units in buildings. Uh, as you can see, we have a Finnish machine gun down here that's firing into this building here. Uh, if we lift up the camera, we see we have some British infantry and a top floor there covering the windows. So, shooting works exactly the same. Um, just with a couple extra modifiers because you're shooting into buildings. Now, um, we'll get into shooting artillery and HE and, and indirect fire in the buildings. But this is quick and simple. So you have a medium machine gun that has uh, five shots. Now, obviously, once again, you would declare your target. You're going to measure. Uh, we already know I'm in range, but that's going to be considered long range. Now, all buildings are considered hard cover, so it's normally threes to hit becomes fours because of hard cover. Um, I'm sorry, becomes four because of long distance, becomes sixes because of hard cover. So you get five dice, you would need sixes to hit. We roll, I actually got one there. So we take away all misses. <clears throat> now, as we said, normally when shooting, all modifiers are placed on the to hit rolls. But when you're shooting at a building, they also get a plus one on the damage because they are in a building, obviously, so it's a little bit harder to hit them. So normally veterans, you would need a five to hit them. In this situation, we actually need a six because they're in a the building. So we'd roll that one dice, <laughs> actually rolled a six. I wish this was darn a game. So in that case, we would actually cause a wound. Now because it is a six on wounding, we roll again. That time, not so lucky, rolled a five. So, but it would cause a wound in that situation, just not an exceptional. Um, so you see that actually being in buildings gives you that additional cover. Uh, so it does help. Now when we get into uh, talking about, again, weapon stats with the penetration or shooting HE or indirect fire, that can take a play, you know, that takes a chance being in a building when you're being hit with massive artillery because the building can collapse on you. We'll probably cover a little bit of that here. Um, we won't cover everything when getting into buildings because it does get a little bit uh, in depth, but for basic shooting purposes it does give you plus two for hard cover plus a plus one on damage so definitely being in buildings can help you stay a little more uh a little it's a little more viable you can stay alive a lot longer so there's that quick one here we'll go over to another scenario here in a second okay as we said in the beginning i'm not going to cover every special rule uh in the gaming system here but one of the ones i really want to cover are snipers. Uh, snipers are probably you're going to see used in every single army. Um, if not, I highly recommend using one. Um, they're a great tool to have uh, and we'll go over explaining why here in a second. So I have a sniper team right here, two-man sniper team, Finnish sniper team, and they see some Brits hanging out down here along this hedgerow. So they're going to fire at them. Again, shooting works the same way. You declare the target, they can react if they want, you measure. Now this measured out is um, right about 19 inches. They have a 36 inch range um, for their sniper. Now what's important to note is if you say you're declaring a target and you measure and they're within 12 inches and you stated that you're using a sniper shot, the, the actual rifle, 
and they're within 12 inches, that shot auto misses. So you can declare as things get a little closer that the rifle, uh, that the sniper is just going to fire normally without using a scope. That way, if it's within that 12 inches, it fires as a regular rifleman, and you don't have to worry about that. But here's what makes snipers so impressive. So they ignore all negative to hit modifiers when shooting, just like we talked about that chart. The only things that they come into play are if they have a pin or if they're missing their assistant. If they're missing their assistant here, then it's the plus one as the last man standing to be able to fire or if they have any pins on them. Other than that, distance, cover, small man teams, um, all of that stuff does not matter. It's, it's the straight up threes to hit, which become very important. They also ignore gun shields and extra protection. So if you got a artillery piece that you're firing on that has a gun shield rule, um, they ignore that. So they're they're pretty pretty impressive on that because most of the time you're hitting on a three straight up. The other beautiful thing about snipers is every time you cause a damage, it is automatically considered an exceptional damage roll. Um, so. As you can see, that's pretty impressive. So the firing player can pick any model of the unit targets. It's a sniper. He's going after the big guy. So, yes, it's only one shot, but you would roll the dice. And I always roll off camera. That's my skill. Now it's a two. That's a miss. But we're going to say it's a three, and it's a hit. So you still roll to wounds. So it's a straight five to wounds. Again, it's a two. But we're going to say that that's a five. Normally, you would need sixes to wounds or to uh, do an exceptional damage. In this case, it caused a wound. The shooting player, the finished player, would automatically get to choose a model to remove over there. So there's there's some special rules dealing with snipers. I wanted to cover them again specifically because you'll see them played out in most army lists just because of the potency because you can really lock down a whole half of a table here because if he wants to put his platoon commander out or a special weapons team that you really want to take out, <coughs> it can do some damage. Now, there's there's some rules with exceptional damage um, that I'll cover briefly here just because I, I've seen this played two different ways and I've gone back and forth talking to people about how the rule book actually says because there's a lot of confusion. With exceptional damage and picking a model, you have to look to see when firing at weapons teams exactly what the stat line is. Because say we have our machine gun team here. If you would do an exceptional damage shot on this, you could actually take out the entire machine gun. Because uh, again, the way the rule book is, you either hit the machine gun and it actually damages enough that it can't fire, or you take out the, the, the gunner and the other two run, whatever the case may be. Um, Exceptional damage can take out an entire weapons team. Now, it cannot take out an entire artillery piece because these are crewmen. So there, there are rules on, um, you know, obviously once you get down to, you start losing crew members, uh, it's harder for it to shoot, so there's modifiers there. But if you get exceptional damage on this, you're not taking out this gun. Um, and it can't fire anymore. You're actually taking out the crewmen. So you have to be careful when firing exceptional uh, firing at exceptional damage with things exactly what you're hitting and what you can actually remove as a full team and what you can't. So I just want to touch base a little bit on that. I know there's always some confusing on exactly how the rules state, but it's it's pretty cut and dry when you actually look at it. Okay, before we add another layer um, talking about artillery and indirect fire and HE and uh, penetration values as we get into some HE stuff here. I just briefly want to say, if you have the rule book, um, page 62, there's a great weapons chart. It takes up the whole page. I, I don't like showing it on camera because, again, I, I don't like showing stuff out of, out of rule books um, on, on camera. Where people can download, print, whatever the case may be. But um, so far, we've talked everything pretty much was what considered small arms, which had no penetration value. It may have a different amount of shots that it gets, um, a little bit of special rules. We talked about um, but uh, now that we're going to start getting into uh, some of the bigger stuff that actually has penetration values and HE and all of that um, if you ever get confused again get the rule book there's a great weapons chart that explains the range of all weapons how many shots it gets penetration values and any special rules with that uh, when we we're talking about the machine gun firing at the building 
it didn't play a role because it was a straight shot, but that is considered a fixed weapon. So it does have a 45 degree firing arc, so it can't fire out of that arc unless, as we described in the movement video, you take a turn to advance and spin on position to get a better shot. Um, so some things like that when we talk about fixed weapons, they do have uh, they do have that firing arc. So um, it's always good to whether you use the rule book, um, whether you use Easy Army, whatever you use, to know what your stat lines of each weapons team um, and each weapon. So when you're firing, you can make sure that you're applying the proper modifiers. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some big guns here. We're going to talk briefly about uh, artillery, mortars, uh, things of that nature, um, and the special rules that come with them. There's there's quite a few. So again, make sure you're looking at your weapons um, and looking at your stat lines. Um, but we're going to talk first about uh, indirect, the, the keywords of indirect fire and howitzer. Most mortars, I think all mortars, unless there's a few out there I'm not aware of, are considered indirect weapons. Um, that plays a, a pivotal role um, because obviously it's firing at, uh, at, it's lobbing, it's not quite firing direct fire. So anything that's considered indirect, like this mortar here, the way it works is it cannot fire anything within the firing arc of its minimum range. So when they have a minimum range, you have to look to see what that is and you can't fire in that. They still have to be able to see their target, but they can have friendly models intervening. So if you're going to fire indirect, say if I was going to move him over to here, and I'm going to move the camera, and I'm going to fire at those infantrymen down the way, if I got infantry here instead of that armored car, they could still fire because they're firing in the firing arc. Um, so you still have to look at their max range and their min range, but they're firing in the indirect. Um, now we will get into how to actually hit with indirect in a little bit when we talk about it, but the basic uh, situation is instead of having that base of a three up and then rolling modifiers when you're firing indirect fire you always need a six to hit because basically you're trying to range in so it is important to note that um, again there are some other details with that we'll get into it here in a little bit but i just want to briefly talk about indirect fire uh, now we said that they have to be able to see the model there's situations where they can't so i have a heavy i'm sorry medium mortar and a medium artillery piece here. But what I also have, I'm gonna move the camera a little bit here, is in this building here, I have a spotter for my artillery piece. Over here, I have a spotter for my mortar. They can use those spider, those spotters line of sight to help them uh, on the battlefield. So by placing the artillery in the corner behind the building, it's gonna help protect them a little bit and then they can use their spotter's line of sight as long as it's still within the firing range of that mortar or artillery piece, but that opens up the tabletop a little bit more to them. Um, there's all kinds of rules for spotters. We won't get into, into all of them, but they're always considered down, um, so they're always really hard to hit. Uh, but um, at, And when you deploy them, you, you deploy them together at one time, but if you choose that the spotter's not in a good spot and you want to move it somewhere else, the artillery piece can't fire that turn because it's spiders getting into you. It's the same activation dice for both of them. Um, so I just wanted to briefly touch on that. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is the keyword of howitzer, which is what uh, most artillery pieces have in there. <clears throat> what that means is I can choose to fire indirectly with him using his spotter, or he can fire line of sight. Again, if he is firing indirectly, he needs a six to be able to hit. Uh, if he is using the howitzer special rule and using line of sight, then his firing direct fire, uh, all modifiers apply where there cannot be intervening, intervening friendly uh, troops. And again, all modifiers apply, so it's the three base, and then add the modifiers to that to see if he's going to hit. Even firing as a howitzer direct line, it always does hit as a HE special rule, uh, which we will get into here in a second. Okay, let's talk about HE here, because uh, this gets a little bit in-depth. So when you have artillery, uh, mortars, artillery, whatever it may be, on their stat line, they'll have an HE and then a number in parentheses. It could be anything from 1, 2, 3, or 4. What that is, is in the beginning video, we showed you this handy template here. You have the 1 inch, the 2 inch, the 3 inch on the inside, the 4 inch on the outside. 
Um, so depending on your your weapon, like here we have our medium mortar, it uses an HE3. What that means is when we're going to see to determine what we're going to hit with, we're using the three inch uh, template on the inside here. So you would roll to hit as normal, whether you're using indirect or direct fire, to determine if you hit the unit. Once you determine if you hit it, we then would use this template to determine exactly what type of damage we do. So we're going to pick up the camera here and we're going to come over to say they were firing at this unit right here. Now, because I do an HE3, you would place the three inch templates over them and any model partially or fully under that template would actually be considered hit. So however many models you have under whatever size template it tells you to use, you would then get that many hits. Now a unit can choose to go down um, before shots are fired and that reduces it in half. So say in that case, I could get all 10 under the template. You could then reduce it to only five hits. So that's how you would use the template to determine how many hits it's going to do or how many wounds it actually is going to do. Um, so it would do the 10 hits and then you would then roll to determine the wounds based off of how many guys are actually under the template. Now, with using template weapons, there are a few other stat lines on the chart. For an example, pinning. As we've said before, every time a unit gets hit, it gets one pin marker. Now, because we're getting hit with such a high volume of fire with artillery shells, uh, that would then determine how many pins they do. For example, again, using the medium howitzer, it actually does D3 pins. So you would roll for that to see how many pins you got. And there's a six. So it would have th that unit would get three pins on them um, because obviously they're getting hammered by large artillery shells. So again, you would use a chart or use easy armor, whatever it is, or the book that you have to determine uh, exactly how many pins you get. So say that unit did not go down and, or let's say it did just to be nice to him. So it's going to actually do five hits to him. Now, when rolling to damage, Again, there's a separate column in here that talks. Now we're getting in, talking about penetration values. A three inch artillery piece does plus three to the penetration. So um, that plays a role in armor. It also plays a role when hitting infantry because that penetration value gets modified to the damage roll. Then being veterans, we've already said that they would need fives to wound. Now, because it's a penetration of three, that drops it down to needing two ups to actually wound those guys. So you would roll them, and they're all two ups. Oh, no, I'm sorry, there's a one in there. So four of them would then take wounds, be removed, and then you would then uh, go ahead and take them around like normal. So you can see how devastating artillery is using HE values, because not only did we take out four guys, we've also put three pins on them. Um, so now they're pretty well stuck there. And that plays a role in if that was an indirect fire, uh, which we'll get into here shortly, but I just want to explain kind of how HE works. There's another uh, line in the chart that talks about uh, hits versus targets in buildings. Um, for example, for how many hits it actually does. If units in the building, yes, they normally have added protection, but now they're getting hit with HE. So there's all kinds of shrapnel flying from the shells plus the buildings. You can actually uh, do more hits um, when they're in a the building. For example, a Again, the medium howitzer with a three inch diameter does two d six hits to those to that unit that would be in that building. Um, so it's obviously much more powerful. So there's pros and cons to being in buildings, as we just showed you in both examples there. Um, but from there, you know, there's there's certain things that can do multiple he um, when you get into like the rocket pods um, or the Neville Wolfers that the Germans have things like that. They do multiple he shots. We're not going to get into all that. It works the same same way. You would just place the first template and then place the second one connected to, or touching that where the first template was and so on and so forth so you can get more shots in there. Um, but that's how HE works. We'll actually go through some examples here to show you um, firing direct firing and firing indirect uh, with artillery and mortars to show you exactly how it would work in a gameplay scenario. Okay, we're going to go over a scenario here where my officer just snapped two, these two artillery units, 
um, which is honestly how I usually play. I usually have an artillery park in the back where I could do some damage here. Um, but put both these guys on the fire. They're both going to use, well, let's see, the medium howitzer is going to use his spotter there. And the medium mortar is going to use his spotter here. So the medium mortar will be firing on them. And the uh, howitzer will be firing on him. Now, we're going to run two different scenarios here. So, first one is this is the first time this artillery piece has fired on that infantry. Now, he does not have direct line of sight, so he has to fire indirectly. So, he needs a 6 to be able to fire indirect fire. So, I roll, he rolls a 1. So, he does not hit. So, now, what happens is that unit is now technically considered ranged in. What that means is if that unit does not move next turn, it goes down to needing a 5 to be able to hit that unit. So I have these handy dandy little, like along with my pin markers, indirect fire ranged in. So this unit's now ranged in on a 5. What that means is if that unit or that artillery piece does not move next turn, I only need a 5 to hit them. Just like in the following turn, if again, if they don't move, it's a four. It auto, it auto starts to go down or automatically. Once they are ranged in, if say I scored a six and I hit them, they're now ranged in on a two. So if again, if they do not move and my artillery piece does not move, I only need a two to hit them. That becomes really important because if you score a hit and you do D3 pins on them and you get three pins on them, and they're just trying to rally and trying to trying to dig themselves out or get moving and they can't or they fail an order test they're stuck there they're going to keep getting hammered so you can quickly whittle down a unit if that's the case so it's, it's important to hit them so they failed there with the one we're going to say now my mortar is going to try to fire in on these guys now he's been attempting the past few times to try to hit him so now they're ranged in on a four up so took two past two turns tried it on a six didn't get it tried it on a five didn't get it they would then get to roll, and I roll a 1. So, next turn, they would need a 3-up. That's the wrong way. They would need a 3-up. And so on and so forth. Again, if they would score that hit, they are now ranged in on a 2. <clears throat> and then you would go through and apply the pins, the damage, um, follow those same normal steps in shooting. So, you, again, you can see kind of how artillery works. Um, direct fire works exactly the same if you have something that says it's a howitzer. So if we had this guy here out in the open, which wouldn't be that smart, but he would have direct line of sights onto those guys over there, you would work out hit rolls just as you would normally infantry. Three to hit, you would check to see if it's under half range or if it'd be considered long range, and then it can fire. If it hits, it does not count as now you can indirect fire on a two because they didn't indirect. They didn't get those coordinates in. They just did a direct shot at them. So you would still do normal as normal. You still use the template because although it's a direct shot at them, it's still lobbing it up into the air. So um, you're still using or it's still using the HE explosive shells, I should say. So. You still use the template when it comes to that, um, but they're not considered ranged in, so you would either have to then range in next turn or just continue to do direct fire. So again, that's basically how artillery works. If you lose your spotter, you lose your line of sight for them. Um, again, HE, indirect fire, howitzer, or, or big keywords you'll need. Um, HE does play a role, as you can see, with penetration values when you're firing at armor. Um, which we'll get into in a bit. I want to do just direct shooting with armor first, explain how that all works, and then we'll do some in intermingling with artillery firing on armor and armor firing on infantry and vice versa, and we'll give you some more scenarios on how that plays out. Just to show you some different stuff. There's a whole bunch of different ways and scenarios that you're going to come across in the game. This is just to give you a basic idea of how some of those situations would work. So um, we'll get into cleaning up the table a bit here as I made a mess, and We'll actually get into some armor action here shortly. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about armor and how that works in the shooting phase. Again, keep repeating, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, penetration values, armor values, and how that all plays out when you're actually firing at things that you need greater than that, that six to hit on to actually do the damage. So 
Here we have a T3485 is considered a medium tank with a uh, heavy anti-tank gun uh, facing off with a Mark IV Churchill um, that is considered a heavy tank and that has a medium anti-tank gun on it. <clears throat> so a little bit better armor, not as good of a gun whereas the uh, T-34 is a little bit better of a gun, but not as great of armor. So both have some weaknesses and strengths against each other there. So in this case, we pulled an activation dice. The T-34 is going to fire. We checked the range. That thing has a, a, a range of 72 inches, so we know it's within half that distance. And this works just the same as normal. You need a base three to hit plus all the modifiers. So we're going to roll dice over here against the fence so it can see and we rolled a three so it hits <clears throat> now that anti-tank gun on the t-34 has a penetration value of six plus again what that means is uh it's a very big gun so whatever the penetration value is when you're firing uh with this stuff that actually needs these penetrations is you're going to roll one d6 so i'm going to roll up against the fence here and i rolled a four so you take the D6 plus whatever the penetration value is of the gun firing, which is a 6, which gives us an equal of 10. Now, that armor on that tank has a penetration value, or a damage value, basically an armor value of 10 up. So in that case, we have matched what that can actually do. Um, so in the rule book, again, there's a nice handy dandy chart dealing with vehicles and damages and how that actually works. So we actually did score a hit. We actually did score damage to it. Now what happens is we're going to roll to see exactly how that works. Okay, once we have determined that we actually were able to cause a damage to the vehicle, and again, to cause damage, all you have to do is e uh, roll the D6 plus a penetration value and either be equal to or greater than the armor value on the tank. So in this case, we rolled a six, the armor value is a 10. There is a chart in the rule book on page 108 um, that we then roll a separate D6 on to see what actual damage we cause on that. Again, I don't wanna show the actual rule book, but I'm gonna briefly go over these here real quick. So on a one or less, the crew is stunned. Uh, if there's already a activation dice near the tank, you turn it to down to represent that. If there is not one, you take the dice out of the bag, put it to down, and it can't do anything for the rest of the turn. In addition to already receiving the pin you got on it for just hitting it, it's going to receive one additional pin. You then also roll if there is a turret on the vehicle, which most vehicles have unless you're doing with an assault tank or something like that, or an assault gun. If there's a turret on it, you roll a D6. On a one or three, nothing happens. On a four to six, that turret stays jammed in whatever direction it's facing. So like the this, uh, Churchill down there would be straight ahead. If this had gotten it, it'd be, have to stay at that angle. That's important if you have it, you know, face to the back for whatever reason, or now to shoot at something, you have your rear showing. Um, so that's basically on a one. On a two, it becomes immobilized. So it, it gets one additional pin marker like normal, and it cannot move for the rest of the game. So it basically becomes a uh, immobile bunker. It can still fire, it can still do everything. Uh, you still have to roll on the turret jam to see what happens. Um, one thing of note, if they have additional, if they have more than one turrets, which some vehicles do, you randomize on a D3, D2, whatever, however many turrets it has to determine which turret it actually is that's jammed. So on a two, it becomes immobile. On a three, the vehicle catches on fire. Uh, basically what happens is you add an additional pin marker and you take a morale check immediately. If the test is passed, the fire has been put out and you basically place a down order and um, it took basically that turn to actually put out the fire. Uh, it can't take any further action, it's done for that turn. If it's failed, the crew abandons the vehicle and is considered knocked out. So basically the tank just becomes a piece of terrain. It sits there. Um, so again, if it's on fire, put an additional token, additional pin, you, you roll to see on a morale test if they can put it out using the modifiers of the pins. On a four, five, or six, the vehicle is knocked out, becomes destroyed, becomes wrecked, becomes a piece of terrain, um, just sits there. Whether you pop the turret off, you put a cotton ball, you know, black and cotton ball, however you want to do it. Um, if you have wrecked tanks, you can put them on, but basically it becomes destroyed. At that time, you remove the action die for it, either from the off the table or out of the bag, like normal. Um, so we're going to roll 
to see what we actually did on the damage chart. Now, because we matched the armor value at 10, we did not beat it, it's considered superficial damage. So when you roll the D6 on that chart, it's automatically subtracted by three to determine what you actually do to that. Um, if you've done full damage or beat the damage, it's a regular D6. Um, if you have rolled massive damage, which means you've beaten the penetration or the armor value by three or greater. So again, it has a front armor of 10. I, if I had a 13 somehow, which um, can't really be done, um, but it's actually, I guess in some cases it probably could, depending on what gun you have, super heavy. But um, in this case, uh, we didn't, but you would it would be considered massive damage. For that to happen, you actually roll uh, two results and you combine them or take the highest if it's knocked out, whatever the case may be. Um, and if it's open topped and hit by indirect fire, you get to add one. One thing I did not cover is when dealing with armor penetration to see if we actually do damage to it. There is a small chart on page 107. If you're hitting on a side or top armor, it's plus one. If you're hitting on a rear armor, it's plus two. If you're at that long range, it's negative one. So I rolled a 10. Now, if we were considered that long range, it would have been negative one to my roll. So I would have actually failed. If I would be hitting on the side armor, it'd be plus one. I would actually hit on 11 and it wouldn't be superficial. But in this case, it is. So we're gonna roll and see what I get on the chart. So I rolled a one. Well, normally it'd be superficial, minus three. You can't get any lower than that. So that Churchill just becomes stunned. It can't do anything this turn. Um, that's easy. That's basically how it works out. Um, again, using those penetration values, anytime anything has a penetration value and you're shooting at something that's above a soft skin where it actually has an armor value, it's always to damage D6 plus the penetration value. So that is important to note. Now, um, that thing being a heavy anti-tank gun, it's actually a uh, HE2 also. So if I was firing this at infantry, it would fire it as, as direct hit, but then it would be considered an HE2 when seeing how much damage it actually does to the gun. So you gotta look at the stat lines um, because it does play a part depending if you're hitting uh, armor, anything over that six up needing to damage or infantry. Um, so that is armor on armor. Again, it's very easy. To hit is still the same modifiers as normal, whether you move or whether you cover, whatever it may be. And again, how you play covers up to you. You see there's an AEC armored car sitting behind the shrubs. In my opinion, um, it basically it's, it, the rule book says 50% of the model has to be visible. I do the same thing for cover. You know, that's a small head roll. It's good, head roll is good for infantry. It's not going to block armor. <clears throat> again, we have some guys that play with some bigger bocage and they play it as if the tank guns are over the bear or the barrel of the gun is over the hedgerows, it can still shoot that. Um, and then you have to take that 50% visibility if it's concealed or not into play. So again, it's very important to determine that, but that's a real quick down and dirty on armor on armor firing and dealing with penetration values. Um, I wanna run a couple more scenarios here dealing with uh, some infantry one shot firing on uh, tanks and maybe do some like artillery firing on them. So uh, we'll set the table and we'll go over that next. Okay, next I wanna run through a quick scenario here of uh, artillery, whether it be a mortar, uh, howitzer, um, whether it be indirect or using the howitzer open sights and firing direct line. It uh, works out the same, but I wanna cover that firing on armor. So in this situation, we have our Medium howitzer has a direct line of sight on that AEC Mark III. Uh, again, when you're ranging in, you can do it as an indirect fire, which is exactly how we described earlier. You roll a dice on a, on a six, it ranges in. If neither have moved, it, uh, the dice roll you need is one less each turn. Um, but in this case, I have a direct line of sight with the howitzer, which works out to fire a little bit better. Um, with indirect fire, there's a minimum range as described in their stat line with a direct shot over the open sights. There is no minimum range, so I can hammer that AEC straight forward. Um, and it works the same whether you range in or, or I'm sorry, whether you do an indirect fire or whether you do a direct line as far as how to actually roll and damage it. So in this case, I would roll to see if I hit and it's a straight shot. So we're going to roll D6 and I, I got a six on it. So we hit. Now, even with artillery, even though it's, a, it's you're firing as a direct shot, it does not have the penetration line. All it says for the special rules are HE. 
So you would have to look at the HE special rule for that gun. In this case, as we showed um, when we were firing an infantry earlier, it's an HE3. So that gives it the penetration value of a three. So you then work out the exact same way as you did um, when firing at it uh, with the other tank. You roll a D6 and I rolled a six. So it's six plus whatever the HE is, which is a th uh, which was a three. So we hit on a nine. Now that has an armor value of an eight. So we have then penetrated the armor. Now, again, remember that if you, I was firing this as indirect, um, it doesn't matter in, except for the situation of if that was an open top. So you take the chance if you want to fire an open top because you'll get a plus, you know, the better benefit. But in this case, direct shot, we hit it on a nine, we damage it, you would then roll on a chart. Now there is no superficial on this because we have beat what we actually needed and we rolled a four. So then you would con uh, consult the chart in the rule book. In this case, it's knocked out. So that artillery piece just took out that AEC marked, uh, Mark three. So artillery again works the same way, except that it may not say directly that it has a penetration value, but you have to look at your HE stat line and see exactly what that pen is for that HE. Um, again, it's pretty standard that it's HE one through four, and that's the size uh, circle that you would use template wise for inches, and that's usually what the, uh, that's what the penetration value is. So it keeps it easy, but you just have to remember to look at that stat line um, just for that difference there. But yeah, um, in this case, the finish are doing pretty good. I mean, they've rolled pretty well to knock out both things. Um, doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you may uh, you may hit it and not actually do any damage or you just stun it. Um, the big thing is you gotta remember you're putting pins on it. Um, so even if you stun it, you're putting two pins on the vehicle, which will help next turn, obviously. Um, again, as we've talked about in the movement video and in this video, sometimes pinning is all you really need to worry about to keep something out of the, out of the fight. So I wanna run one more scenario here with some infantry um, and we'll get into that in a second. Okay, I wanna run one quick more little scenario here uh, dealing with some infantry. We have tucked behind this building here. Uh, I do have a Panzer Shrek team here um, that can fire at that Churchill if need be. Now it's obviously behind the building, so when you take the activation, you would have to move it your six inches. So it's putting it around the building, obviously it's exposed, but you're hoping with the chance that you would actually take that out. From there, it works exactly the same as, as we've done everything else. You roll to hit, it's a three up. Now it did move, so it becomes a four up. You have to check the range once again, um, but you roll to hit. Panzer checks are a base of penetration value of a six. Um, so they can be very useful. You get one shot per turn. So if for some reason a tank would survive and your guys survive the onslaught of firing next on it, they would then get to make the shot uh, next turn or run away if need be. Um, there are models you can put in infantry that are Panzer Fausts <clears throat> that work exactly the same way. The only thing with Panzer Fausts is they are a one shot uh, item. So once you fire it once, it's gone. So obviously you don't want to use it if it's going to be a long shot where you're going to need sixes or sevens just to even hit the vehicle. You want to use them and save them for best opportunity. But again, that works exactly the same as any other type of thing with the penetration value. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, I did not go into as much detail as I thought I was gonna go with some of the things. Um, I didn't really cover shooting artillery in the buildings and bringing a building down, which you can actually do depending on the size of the artillery you're using if you're using something with a lot of HE. Um, I didn't cover, <clears throat> there's some specifics dealing with vehicles when putting pins on them based if they're inexperienced, regular or veteran. Um, as far as what can pin them and what can't. There's scenarios where uh, if you have a veteran tank and you hit them with something that wouldn't be able to fully penetrate them anyway, it's gonna shrug off it and it's not gonna take the pen, whereas an experienced team may panic and they will get pinned on that. So I didn't cover all those. Um, that's really getting into the weeds with something. I wanted this to be real quick and easy. This is how you roll dice to see if you hit. This is how you kill something, um, which I think I covered basically everything Again, didn't cover every scenario, but that's not the purpose of these videos. Um, I try not to ramble on too much because I can give you a thousand scenarios on, on how that's going to work. Um, but if you like what you saw, please comment. If you saw that I did something wrong, which there's a very good chance I did, please comment. Uh, please subscribe. Um, I will be getting around to filming the 
next video dealing with actual assaulting and close combat, which should happen, uh, be a very quick video, should happen quickly, there's not a whole lot to that one, again, it's rolling some dice and going from there. Um, this was kind of the, the, the big meat and potatoes of it. Um, and again, I didn't go through every single scenario and all the different modifiers, but it's a good basics of what you need. So uh, please subscribe, please follow. If you like what you saw, comment. If you got some constructive criticism, please comment. Um, I'm trying to get these videos out over a long period of time. So uh, trying to get better with my camera work as I get going here and stuttering and stumbling through some rules and all that I'm still trying to work out. So um, I hope you enjoyed. Again, please comment. Please stay tuned for the next coming video here in the next couple weeks. And thanks for watching and happy gaming.